have the pleasure to uh, welcome Jaime Mayor Oreja, who is uh, the president of the Royal Institute of European Studies, but also the president of the One of Us Federation. Uh, Permítanme unas muy breves reflexiones en este. Allow me very briefly in the beginning of the, the closing of this event that will of be officially closed uh, by my admired uh, friend uh, Remy Braga. Uh, I'd like to thank you for being here in Brussels in this uh, event brought to you by the Institute of European Studies uh, and CEFAS, uh, an institute under the uh, San Pablo CEU University. And I'd like to thank uh, the latest chancellor for giving us the opportunity to put this event together. Thank you for being here. I'd like to thank all the speakers. I'd like to acknowledge uh, all the people who have helped uh, at one of us uh, for 50 plus, 50 plus organizations um, uh, gathered here uh, uh, to discuss abortion. I'd like to conclude uh, with three remarks that are different, but uh, intertwined. And if I may, I will finally draw a conclusion of today's meeting. First and foremost, we should not forget that we're all uh, undergoing a transit, a transition in Western society in Europe. This is not any other time. We're truly undergoing a transition. Ones and others, those who defend uh, some foundations and those who oppose them. And transition means that uh, as those uh, who were born in the decade following the World War, and soon learned that a new time had come about because the war had diagnosed the situation. Today's uh, your new generation of Europeans and Spaniards don't know what at stake. We can perhaps uh, uh, see that it may be the end uh, of a phase of a stage because of social disorder, because of this feeling that we have that a cycle is coming to an end that we are unable to foresee. Notwithstanding this, uh, we realize in our diagnosis that we're at the end of a phase and transition. This is uh, sure always entails uh, weakness, uh, doubt, decadence. And some of us say that it is precisely at this time, although some may ridicule this or disregard the very roots we have, we say that it is precisely during transition when the foundations are important. Uh, Christian foundations define uh, the uh, position of those of us here. My second remark is that this discussion that uh, we've uh, heard today, very brilliantly, by the way, should not. Uh, uh, make us forget that the main problem uh, that we face is that many for a long time have uh, sought to replace uh, a society based on Christian uh, foundations by an implacable social disorder. Indeed, wars, which are the uh, highest expression of evil, This evil is a consequence of uh, the legitimation of uh, abortion. And there are other symptoms of evil, but I won't go into that today. But as abortion could now be considered an idea, identity right of the EU, we need to understand that we are in the midst of a transition that has set out to destroy one society in favor of another one. And my third remark, by way of conclusion, is that what is most important 
is our personal attitude with which we face this time. And I must admit that those of you who are here, those who are here from Brussels and other um, community institutions have overcome a huge uh, fear of this uh, dominant fashion. I've uh, suffered uh, two fears, a physical fear and a reverential uh, fear. The reverential fear to an atmosphere is uh, toughest to be considered uh, a bad European or a bad Spaniard because you have this or that uh, political uh, position. Well, you've overcome this reverential fear, which can only increase. It can never uh, subdue because they want uh, our silence to be accomplice of what they're uh, attempting to destroy in society. We know that we cannot part of that uh, accomplice silence because there can only be a regeneration of our dear European Union if uh, our fundamentals and principles uh, are regenerated too, and there will only be a future of Europe if we can uh, go back to the Christian roots of Europe. So our silence can never be accomplished, cannot be so. But what is important is not uh, today's event, but our attitude uh, going forward, because uh, 50 organizations are many, and we need to take a many steps forward, leaps forward, and we need to hold many more events. And today we're holding the first event to remember Macron's statement on May the 9th. There have to be many more. We cannot stop here. We need to mobilize because we may be a minority as Isabel very rightly mentioned, but we need to change our personal attitude or and institutional attitudes. And we need to be clear on the fact that whatever does not add, subtracts. Whatever adds, multiplies. All that subtracts, divides. And everything that does not add and uh, remains as a single nation or single institution will not be doing its part in Europe. And regardless uh, the principle of subsidiarity that I fully support, we need to take a step forward in Europe. This is uh, our obligation, it's mandatory. And that was my third remark. And in closing, allow me for one more observation. We've heard, and it's been well explained here, that we know uh, that the main ally of those who want this new society want us uh, to settle, to adapt. They want our silence because they're trying to shape uh, this new society, not like the Nazi or communists did by propaganda. They're doing this by the alliance of silence. They're not truly explaining what they set out to be. Hence the importance of uh, our not being optimistic or pessimistic. But whatever we do, we need not uh, settle. We should never uh, move away from what we believe in. And I'll say something that might uh, be deemed uh, politically incorrect, but the loss of faith is the cause among causes of what's going on in Europe. Loss of faith. And this is food for thought. Why is this so? Of course, faith can never be imposed, let alone uh, today, but we should not shy away from this. Similarly, we know and uh, our dear Portuguese friend uh, said this, we need to focus on uh, making sure abortion is not included in uh, the European charter, but uh, we should not shy away from the fact that we know that abortion cannot be a human right. By and large, we need to be 
brave. We need to overcome reverential fear. We need uh, this unity of many to challenge, to face this challenge that the fundaments, Christian fundaments of Europe are the only future for this wonderful European Union. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jaime. You have always been an inspiration for us all. So uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, now I have the pleasure to invite uh, Alfonso Julián de Mendoza, who is the president of the Asociación Católica de Propagandistas and also the president of the uh, San Pablo Cero Foundation, uh, who has made possible this this event. Thank you very much. Dear friends, thank you very much indeed for participating in this event, for accompanying us in this event. Uh, can abortion really be a fundamental right? Every year in Europe, a large amount of people, thousands, hundreds of thousands, want to come here and live. They want to live in peaceful coexistence with us, uh, without violence. In fact, uh, they want to do so in silence, inadvertently, without making noise. Uh, we should say that in general, the media don't uh, uh, report on them and treat them as if they did not exist, but they're there. They don't jump fences. They don't uh, breach uh, laws uh, and they don't want to impose other cultures nor different uh, lifestyles. On the contrary, they, are predisposed uh, to uh, adapt to our languages, our culture in a very docile way. They just want to live. They want to be given an opportunity to show that their lives can be good for those uh, who shelter them and accept them. However, this attempt uh, to live in our land, this uh, attempt to be European citizens as ours, in order to enjoy our very opportunities and to thrive in safety as uh, pro provided by the EU, that uh, attempt uh, can not only find uh, full rejection, but uh, may cost uh, them their lives. Indeed, these new migrants, these people who want to come here and whose boldness is simply to want to live with us Europeans, are at the mercy of somebody who rightly or not uh, decide to do away with their lives. These immigrants uh, have been deprived uh, from protection by law. Furthermore, it's, uh, some uh, uh, believe that their lives can be done away with uh, just uh, by uh, uh, an arbitrary judgment uh, should be a fundamental right. This is the situation which thousands uh, of uh, humans uh, are in. The, these lives have been deprived of all right to live among us. Uh, however, these lives exist, uh, they are real, and only by means of violence uh, can be eliminated uh, from the wombs of their mothers. Why don't they have a right? Why are they deprived of all um, protection? What is the justification? Honestly, it is hard to understand, and I'm afraid that uh, we uh, are there is no reason, but, but rather there is unreason in the face of this and the, the face of this radical transition of what was used to be considered uh, uh, an offense uh, uh, is now uh, intended to become a fundamental right. So I'm thinking about uh, the Macbeth, which is who's uh, said uh, fair is foul and foul is fair and now they want uh, law to be unjust and there's an attempt to include abortion in uh, the uh, charter of fundamental rights of the eu and these uh, sorcerers or apprentices uh, are trying to go beyond what has been enshrined in national uh, constitutions and they want abortion to be a dogma something that cannot be questioned without immediately de declaring excommunicated those uh, who will go against this or prescribe them those who think differently so it is clearly an imposition of ideas uh, that uh, 
set out to do away with the dissent. It is a totalitarian attempt on a part of the European Union, even full countries that don't agree with such a grave matter. We do not agree with this in the face of refounding of Europe, because this refounding of Europe has very little to do with that Europe that came about in the aftermath of World War II with the, that the, the founding fathers uh, have dreamt up because they affirmed that um, fair is fair and foul is foul and uh, th 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 then foul cannot become a fundamental right. Men who dreamed of uh, uh, welcoming uh, uh, land for those who want uh, to live there. They dreamed of a land, a future, and hope, uh, may God help us go back to that land. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alfonso, for these uh, beautiful words. And now we are going to welcome another authority in the defense of values in Europe, which is uh, Rocco Buttiglioni. So uh, please, you have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends, I must begin with a confession. I love Europe. I love the European Union and I want more union, not less union. Um, but I don't like this union. I don't like this Europe. And I think we should uh, try to see a little bit what is the history that has brought us to this point. Those of my generation, those who were 20 years old in, the, in 1968, have had a great fortune. Uh, we have seen uh, the way in which God has put his finger in European history and has changed the face of the earth. To June 2nd, 1979, victory place in uh, Warsaw. John Paul II came and said, um, Men cannot understand the history of Poland, we might say of Europe, without that fundamental unity of measure that is the presence of Jesus Christ. Um, you cannot understand man without this measure. And uh, a nation that was sleeping, that was asleep, that had lost the memory of its dignity, of its unity, of this culture, all of a sudden woke up. And uh, the peoples of the earth, the peoples of Europe, also woke up. I have uh, heard one member of the House of Habsburg, I wish to remember here, my friend Otto von Habsburg, the picnic for freedom in, uh, at the border between uh, Austria and Hungary. And one of the most powerful empires in world history collapsed, fell down. So I think we should look towards the future, not towards the past. History changes. We have had a cycle of history that has culminated at the end of the 20th century in which we have done great things. We have reunified Germany, we have reunified, no, we have not reunified Europe. We wanted to reunify Europe, but we had only the enlargement. The reunification was based on an exchange of gifts. We give to you, Hungarians and the Polish people, uh, the art of managing a functioning market economy and perhaps also uh, the rule of law, and you give us what you have discovered in the struggle against totalitarianism, that is the fundamental European values. Christian values? Um, yes, Christian values. Greek values? Of course. Roman values? Why not? Uh, the values of the Enlightenment? Of course. The Enlightenment well, was strongly anti-clerical, but was based on fundamental uh, uh, Christian vision of man. We have lived this age, we have won great victories, and then we were defeated. At the end of the century, we lost. We wanted the Christian values in the Constitution, we did not have them. We wanted the Constitution, and we did not have the Constitution. And we had the, the treatises of Lisbon, uh, a very painful uh, kind of treatises, uh, treatises in which we had not the courage of creating a a, a common European sovereignty, and then we left the space for bureaucracies 
end of the economy without the capacity of having politics. We have no politics in Europe today. Politics was dead. And those who won, who refused our Europe, had no idea for Europe. What did they propose? The so-called Europe of rights. The rights of the individuals without the duties that are the root of the rights of the communities, that are the root of the rights of families, of nations, that are the root of the rights of the weaker. Take the case of abortion. Uh, can you compare uh, my right, the right of a grown up woman with the rights of a fetal? Can you? Well, in most civilization, you could not. Even in Europe once you could not. Can you compare my rights? I am a knight, I am a powerful man, and he's a peasant, he's a serf. Can we have the same right if we have not the same power? And Europe was built upon the conviction that God vindicates the rights of the weaker. God and the king in the name of God and the state. We are about to abandon this vision of politics. But on the other hand, we have entered a new cycle and the Europe of Lisbon has failed. Has failed uh, economically, has failed uh, politically. Europe is shrinking in the world. Uh, Europe is decaying. We are shrinking demographically, economically, politically, uh, uh, culturally. The world is not willing to follow our example. And in the crisis that we have had, we are realized that without the Christian values, we cannot build up a functioning Europe. Because to build up Europe, you need what the Germans call a begeisterung, an enthusiasm. Um, it is an event of God. I, I have, we have, my generation has seen this. Uh, with John Paul II, there was a begeisterung. The spirit of God entered into our souls. And what was impossible, all of a sudden became possible. But we have refused the later this spirit. And without this spirit, you cannot build up a functioning Europe. A new nation can be a reason only through the um, uh, recognition of this presence of God in our history. I think that now comes the time in which we should revindicate this history. In front of the failure of this Europe, of the Europe of Lisbon, it is a technical failure. The European Parliament has set up a commission to study uh, the reform of the treatises, but it is also, a, a first of all, a cultural failure. Um, and we have to give a great uh, cultural battle. I don't think that uh, you will defend the Christian values better in your country, in Portugal, for instance, um, if you are alone, because you are part of the world. And there is a great cultural battle to be led in the world. This cultural battle regards exactly the judiciary. We have lost a great cultural battle in the field of law. The dominant uh, jurisprudence is against us. It is an arbitrary jurisprudence that thinks that the judge is not linked to the letter of the law, but to an arbitrary spirit of the law that he detects and determines in a dialogue with the people now, with the newspapers, with the mass media. We have to give a battle on this point. In the United States, they did, and they won. Then it can be done. If it happened in the United States, it can happen in Europe. And we should be aware of this dimension and of the cultural dimension of the problem. And the first cultural dimension regards the judiciary and the anthropology. Every philosophy of law presupposes an anthropology. We have to give this battle. Shall we win? I don't know. Uh, nobody knows when God will decide again to put his finger in European history. What I know is something else. A few days ago, I was in Brescia uh, and we had a great uh, uh, meeting with Lech Wałęsa uh, on the Europe of John Paul II. There were, there were so many people I had not seen uh, since uh, I don't know how long. Um, and uh, uh, Lech Wałęsa spoke about uh, God that who put his finger in the history of Poland and of, the, and of Europe. And I said, well, look, don't remember, this happened on June 2nd, 1979. 
But until the day before, until the day before, there was no nation, there was no people, there was nothing of nothing. Uh, there was only small groups of people who had no great hope for the future, but who wanted to be faithful, who wanted to remain faithful to truth. Even God, when he decides to put his finger in history, needs to find at least a small people, a group of people who have remained faithful, so that through them, uh, the name of God may be again recognized in history. And they will recognize that not we did it, God did it, just because we are uh, so feeble, so few, non nobis domine, non nobis, said nomini tuo da gloria. Will a new enthusiasm come? Much depends on the capacity of the church of overcoming the present crisis of pedophilia and of going back to give a simple but convincing testimony to the love of Jesus Christ who puts together men and makes of many disjointed people one community, the community of the people of God, of the saint people of God, as Pope Francis uses to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ropo, for this uh, lesson of politics, history, and theology. As a teacher, I would really like to have the capacity to summarize everything as well as you have done it. Uh, and now we are going to uh, leave you with another video. Um, yes, it will be just a minute, and then we will have uh, Balas Orban in the floor. Thank you very much. And now we have Balas Oran. Thank you very much for coming all the way from Hungary. You have the floor. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So, like this. Thank you very much for having me. I'm grateful to be here. As, <clears throat> as I was thinking about what to say today, an old story came into my mind and actually Googled it and realized that uh, it, it, was, it was actually a famous writer, Mark Twain, who said, quote, when I was 14, my father was so ignorant uh, that I could hardly stand being around him. But when I got 21, I was surprised how much he learned in just seven years. I think we can all relate to that. Sometimes things can seem very different as we get older and wiser. This is also true um, for the topic of today's conference. For Christian 
conservative politicians, one principle is clear, and it comes directly from the Bible, that every human being is created in an image of God. This gives every life value, and this is where human dignity comes from. But for me, as an active politician, I'm not here today to talk about theory. I leave that to theologists and priests. In my understanding, my job is uh, to talk about how to transform this biblical idea uh, into practice. In Hungary, for like almost 13 years now, we have the government which is motivated actually by these ideas. So in the next minutes, I would like to share our experience with you, how we can put, in, put this into practice, uh, what works and what doesn't, what were our, our successes and as well as our failures. But before jumping to the treatment, we first need a diagnosis. So here's our diagnosis. 70 years ago, Europe made up more than 20% of the world population. Today, it is only 10. The median age in the European Union increased by 15% in the last 20 years, with the elderly making up 20%. Um, compared to the global average of 10 only. This means that by the end of the century, one third of the Union's population will be over 65 years old. One may ask, is it a problem at all? Some argue no. Uh, they say that the world is already overpopulated. We don't need more newborns. We actually disagree. As the Bible says, be fruitful and multiply. Having a child is a blessing. The more children, the more blessing on humankind. But then what to do to have more people in Europe? Now, some say that we should all turn to migration. Let's bring people over and hope for the best. But should we really solve our problems by, by bringing in millions of people with different cultural backgrounds? Well, it must not come as a surprise that we Hungarians say no, migration is not a magic pill to solve our problems, demographic problems at all. We see traditional families as the backbone of well-functioning society, society in which human dignity uh, gets the respect it deserves. We need more children ever. If it requires efforts and resources, it seems unattainable at first, but, but there is actually no other way around. One thing is clear from, from the start, having children is actually a private issue. So the question is, how can we encourage then our citizens to have more children without interfering in their private life? No one knows the answer for sure. And this is one of the biggest questions of our time. But at least uh, in Hungary since 2010, we have had some number of slow but successful attempts to solve the puzzle. And this is what I want to really uh, quickly share with you today. The central idea is based on the fact that according all research stats and polls, Hungarians and I assume Europeans as well would be willing to have more children than what they end up having in the end. So most probably due to social, cultural and economic factors, they change their mind or, or they're not reaching their own goals. So the goal is for us is not to force them to have more children than what they want, what helped them to get the number of children they already want. And this is a huge difference. We want to live in a society similar to the one we used to have where children were set and the means of perfect life and not the sacrifice as in contemporary life. Our approach seems to be working since the launch of this very different type of attitude. We have almost 200 thousand children more, which equals to the population of the second largest city in Hungary. Um, we tripled our family policy expenditure. Proportionately, Hungary is investing the most resources in the EU, 6% of the GDP to family policy. We support women and want them to feel that they don't have to choose between their personal and professional life. If you have children, it is eased by the state to go back to work. Until you return, you get 100% of your salary, uh, get extra benefits, tax cuts, tax refunds. If you are married and you are signed for having three children, you get immediately 
um, 25,000 euros from the state and further, further financial resources um, to have a house. There are increased number of nurseries, kindergartens, and family friendly workplaces uh, are rewarded. State funded billboard campaigns and ads encourage citizens to build a family. There is a strong culture for pro-family sentiment. And the results were the result speaks for themselves. In the past decade, the number of marriages doubled, divorces halved, the fertility rate went up from 1.2 to 1.6. And what is important for our conference today, the number of abortions halved, actually falling uh, from 44,000 in 2010 to 21,000 in 2021. Um, thank you. Thank you for the mothers and for, uh, for the families. Uh, what is important to mention is that we reached this drop of abortion rate while maintaining popular support in our family policy, not losing the majority of the society without changing any kind of regulation or causing any kind of internal political polarization. In the number of cases, when conservative political forces wanted to open abortion as a regulatory issue, open up it for debate, they received a strong backlash from citizens, often even from their own voters, losing support in the process. This is the reason why we in Hungary is probably controversial here, but it's important that we made the decision that we don't want to change abortion regulations at all. Instead, we turned to other tools, preserving the freedom of choice while the life of the unborn has also become more protected than ever. To sum up, the Hungarian approach is the following. Fight for your unborn population, fight for the new generation, number one. Number two, um, support the families by any means. And the third, don't push away the majority of the society. Create an environment instead in which people, they can get what they want through the means of family policy. We would love to see these basic principles become a Europe-wide consensus. In my experience, um, even if all of this is evident, uh, probably in this room, it is unfortunately, as we were talking about, the minority opinion outside uh, this room. And this is really uh, worrying because the lives of the unborn, uh, the future of Europe is in stake. And previous speakers were talking about um, talking about the future of Europe conference and changing the treaties and giving up unanimity. Um, I can inform you that until we have this government in Hungary, there will be no end of unanimity decision making in the European Union. We will never ever give up our rights and values. Hungary will always be on that on your side in that issue. To conclude. I really want to share with you a funny family story that happened just last week. As some of you might know, I have two, two sons, a two and a four year old. They are absolutely wonderful, but uh, as you can imagine, it's not always easy with them, especially one, not with the older one who is um, deep into the infamous uh, no stage. Uh, but sometimes we have small successes with my wife. Just a couple of days ago, we had a conversation at home when my four-year-old turned to us and said, finally, there is one thing I agree with you on. So we felt intense happiness. And this is, this is the spirit that drives us uh, all together in this room today because all children who are planning to come to earth would agree with us on everything we have just said. So this is our hope, this is our future. Thank you very much. Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much Balas, for, for sharing with us the, the Hungarian experience because I think that Hungary has shown us that there's a lot that can be made to improve the situation. And moreover that people are eager to vote for someone who has uh, made uh, family a priority of his government. So thank you very much.
And now we have Elisabetta Gabini, who has been a former member of the Parliament, the European Parliament, and now is a, a member of the Italian uh, Chamber. So thank you very much for coming, and we have the floor. Grazie. Veramente grazie. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers of this event. I'd like to thank uh, CEU, uh, San Pablo University. Thank you, my colleague, uh, Mayor Oreja, for inviting me. And uh, I'd like to share some reflections, having paid close attention to what has been said here today, because there are not so many places where you can discuss this. In my country, at least, this is something uh, that uh, leads to uh, uh, fighting matches on the floor of Congress, and you don't, you know, go into the deeper crux of the matter. Uh, of a certain age and things are changing. Somebody has said that we're undergoing a transition. Well, there have been times where we could uh, think, reflect and discuss it. And I was thinking, dear Professor Buttiglione, uh, I don't know, who in the 50s uh, promised uh, the beginning of uh, a uh, deep change, and Arendt, as a very important book on uh, the banality of evil, and uh, this, uh, in this book, she says uh, that we've shared life all along. Some people think that life is uh, as a consequence of God, others find its origin elsewhere, but life is granted to us. Back in the 50s, as she would uh, see change, and many thought that life should be at the disposal of men. That's uh, why there is intervention at the beginning and the end uh, of life. And she also said uh, that there issues that cannot be left to the decisions of politicians, experts, uh, um, or people in the academia. It, ha it is up to society together. There are slogans these days that are very extended and uh, if you don't uh, abide this, they say that you're phobic, uh, you're in denial, you uh, say tagged with uh, very unbecoming adjectives. And that extraordinary book that I'm, you know, with, there is a dialogue between Habermas and Ratzinger, uh, reason, faith, and dialogue. Habermas, the greatest uh, living uh, philosopher and theologist at the time used to say that those who don't believe need to listen to believers because our civilization was born following the secularization of Christian pr principle. This has been forgotten these days. Uh, Habermas's example meant that we're all the same because somebody came along called Jesus Christ who said, we're all the same. We're all the children of God and we're all the same in the eyes of the law. And this uh, is uh, uh, compared with the Enlightenment. But I think... Uh, much of history has been erased. But uh, let me tell you something. There was a demonstration in Italy. I think it was, was back in 2005 when the uh, assisted civilization uh, uh, um, campaign, um, a regulation came about and there was a campaign 
in favor of a abstention. And there was this com full campaign by the media. There were athletes, singers, uh, actors, opinion leaders. Uh, so from every corner, there was a campaign to vote for yes. 70% of people did not go out to vote. And of the 25 who voted, five said no. And the 20 percent uh, had to, uh, uh, voted in differently. And uh, some said, you don't need to vote uh, like the Pope, you need to vote yes. Well, let's say 20% voted yes, meaning that 80% of uh, the Italians back in the day people who watch television, who attend conferences, go to the movies, go to school or university, and tend to see their ideas uh, represented. It's, uh, they, they watch television, go to conferences, and they feel, I'm a minority, I'm marginalized, but uh, I'm not sure we're a minority, nor that we're marginalized. After many uh, years of uh, governments in Italy who governed uh, without uh, the support of the voters because there was no clear majority. So these were all coalitions that happened. Uh, there were prime ministers who were appointed uh, but uh, who had not been voted. After some years, there's a government with a clear mandate from the people. And I'm a part of the Conservative Party with the Giorgia Meloni, Fratelli d'Italia. The coalition uh, ran with this uh, program that included a commitment towards family a commitment for the environment but uh, with the men in the environment i think this was pointed out by a, a colleague of the european parliament and my party the first item in the uh, political program stated support for birth and in fact, the, the ministry was called Equal Opportunity Families, is now called the Ministry for Family uh, uh, Childbearing and Equal Opportunities. And this is the program we ran with, and that's what the citizens went for. So I believe that we need to be specific. We need to support families because I think think that uh, the pragmatic approach uh, uh, Paolo Angel mentioned earlier and also uh, Nuno Melo is fundamental when you're in office and uh, especially if you want uh, for people to have peace of mind or else there's an ongoing um, clash and when you're in government you need to solve people's problems and you need to help families the fact that families uh, are at the core of what you do because there are many things that have to do with families in our program we say for example that the families are pillars on which uh, society is built and in the words of uh, john paul ii well i'm not going to tell you everything in our program, uh, but uh, we had uh, many um, items that were in favor of families, uh, taxes benefiting families, uh, checks for families, you know, 200 year checks for each child for working mothers. And uh, in item number one in the program, you can read 
the implementation of law 104 78 on the voluntary interruption of uh, a pregnancy. I think this is true for other countries. In 1978, because you know, society's changed. So I was saying in the, this law was passed in 1978 and in 1981, a referendum was organized with radicals who wanted to uh, extend the right to abortion. And then there was this referendum uh, with the uh, pro-life uh, supporters. The Italians did not support uh, the radicals, but uh, the first part of the law was never implemented that has to do with that has to do with prevention why well if a woman has financial uh, challenges or difficulties at work and uh, feel can't uh, go through with the pregnancy and this is in the spirit of the law you need to help that woman overcome these challenges and difficulties. And this is something that we were committed with and we will uh, walk the talk. And it seems scandalous that we want to set constraints. On the contrary, we want women to be free to follow the spirit of the law, for women uh, to find what Paolo Jean mentioned, the legal solution to a conflict a conflict among fundamental rights and, and, and uh, with this legal solution you don't need to change the law however i'm worried because we all got this email at the uh, european parliament from uh, an mep uh, requesting president uh, to verify the uh, undertaking of uh, pro-life organizations to see if they're in the transparency registry of the EU. And what I'm trying to say is that there's too much, uh, uh, that there's too much uh, aggressiveness that, you know, if it came from uh, sensible people, you, you could uh, discuss uh, calmly. But anyway, so let's talk about the future of Europe. We're in favor of Europe, we're pro-Europe. Uh, but if only uh, there was another Europe, a Europe whereby the principle of subsidiarity be truly implemented. And as my leader always says, Giorgia Meloni, a political dwarf and a bureaucratic giant. We want Europe to focus on the important things and leave the subsidiarity principles in the hands of what states know uh, how to do best. I will um, conclude by saying that I'm part of the delegation of the Council of Europe, uh, representing the European, uh, the Italian Parliament. And since we've heard uh, a lot about the role played uh, by Strasbourg and the European Court of uh, Human Rights, I believe that events uh, like those discussing the legal foundations uh, uh, could be organized uh, in Strasbourg too, because we realize that sometimes custom prevails. Uh, and it uh, goes beyond uh, rights and we need to stop this uh, trend. But governments need to take on a positive uh, outlook uh, in favor of families to defend women because women need to, to fulfill th their will to be mothers because many studies uh, show that many have fewer children that they'd like to, but it's always a practical financial uh, problem.
and uh, it's good to have a government that uh, attempts to respond to that and a government that wants Europe to have a future. We need specific uh, solutions to do away with hurdles and to put families at the heart of everything we did. We just got started. And I hope to come back uh, with figures that show that we were right and that we've done our jobs well next time we meet. Thank you. Now we have uh, our last video, and then we will have the closing intervention by uh, Rami Rack. So, uh, please. Article 1 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights says the dignity of the human being is unviolable. So it's my personal translation into English and German it is die Würde des Menschen ist unantastbar. Or one could say as well the dignity of the human being is sacrosanct. And the Article 2 says that the human being has the right for life. So there is no description in the Charter of Fundamental Rights concerning abortion. Abortion, this challenging problem, and it's a question of conscience, of course, is a question of subsidiarity, and the legislation must always be a national one. And the legislation is very different from one country to the other. But it is very clear that the Charter of Fundamental Rights is not speaking about abortion and that nobody can say that the Charter of Fundamental Rights is allowing or is uh, a, f a basis for abortion. This nobody can say. And my request, my propo proposal is that we should do everything in our national countries to support the life and that children can be born. It's a challenging problem. I know how difficult it is, but we should do everything to help women and families to solve this problem and give life a chance. So now we have the final intervention by uh, Rami Brack. Uh, we are so happy to have you here. 
uh, Rami Rak is, uh, well, I don't have to introduce him, uh, Rami Rak, I think, uh, but he's a member of the Institut de France. He's also a member of uh, one of us. And uh, his interventions are always uh, like the perfect way to finish one of these events. So please, thank you very much. At the end of the event, uh, we are going to kindly ask all the speakers to stay with us so we can take a family picture. So uh, please, uh, let's do that, okay? Thank you very much, Remy, you have the floor. Bien, merci beaucoup. Euh, J'ai préparé quelque chose en français. I've prepared a, a speech in French. Sorry um, for my French, but I've given this conference a very difficult a title which is uh, do what you can i tried to find equivalents in other languages it would be like uh, try your best alone i don't know how to say it in 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 german in english would be like uh, you're on your own and very very frequently they tell we are they labeled us as pro-life is an american term that has uh, been imported but for us we are uh, partisans of life partisans of free uh, election that is terrible life is not simply something or that condition of being alive, something that we share with the plants. We have something else. We have the human life. So as principle, we worry about a human being in all his dimensions, its dimensions. And in, two, in the two generations and in the two genders, we reject uh, putting the woman against the uh, the child unborn or newborn or on the other way on the contrary to put the child against the mother so we reject leaving uh, aside the decision of the mother that rejects also the role of the father and the same happens with the sexual revolution the so-called sexual revolution that has benefited above all the evils of the species i remember a comic uh, from a french drawer called gerard lucie we see a woman a bobo as we say in french bourgeois and she says to her friend oh the pill is really the liberation of the uh, women with the pill my husband can do whatever he wants with my body uh, secondly regarding the election the freedom of choosing maybe some women choose to abort do they do it with full knowledge maybe women who defend the right to abortion have they lived experimented those abortions maybe but for us abortion is almost always a variant of that you're on your own that launches evil to the uh, the, the person that has left her uh, uh, pregnant so in abortion is the women who pays in a very particular sense so to say and that happens that way because abortion is something that a doctor does practices and he gets money from that it's a medical act but it's not it's not a therapy so to say 
It's always the woman who pays. It's her who suffers this invasive practice, who supports the possible or who uh, suffers the possible consequences, physical, psychological, and we know the different lies uh, saying, uh, but we know that abortion is not something free of harm in a time that is already finished. The woman that had to undergo an abortion did it in very terrible hygienic conditions, hygiene conditions. Of course, we have advanced in this way because now their lives are not so much in danger. They risk less to have a big infection or to face a definite uh, uh, sterility, but a, it doesn't constitute a, a, a good, so to say, even though the abortion is done in a sterile condition with anesthesia, it is the woman who has to deal with her own body in the end. Regarding the passive uh, subject of abortion, we reject to draw a limit between the different phases of the youth of a human being, the infancy. We cannot know whether the embryo is a human being or not. Science says that from the very beginning, a program is put forward that if it's not interrupt, interrupted, it will give way to a human, to a citizen's, a citizen. So if we are not sure of a positive uh, response, we will also, so we will be sure of our ignorance. And we cannot give a negative answer to the question of whether it is a human being or not. We do not know what an embryo feels. We do not know what a fetus feels, what a newborn feels. And we will never know from within from the inside we can only do hypothesis therefore it would be good to apply the uh, precaution principle it would be stupid to only apply it to uh, animals it's not only about dealing with the problem the question of abortion isolating it from its causes that means the neglection of the, those responsible in the society in the face of the, uh, those women who are pregnant in an involuntary way. So abortion is a solution. It's a brutal solution, but it also uh, prevents us from seeing the true problem. It's like uh, treating a symptom without worrying about its causes. So some states, some European states, and from other places, on behalf of the whole society uh, to which they uh, think they represent, re let's remember the uh, quotation from Nietzsche. Nietzsche says that the state is a liar, saying that uh, it is the people. But these are the states that tell the woman, just you are on your own these states in this way generalize the this the masculine silliness uh, they even enshrine it it could be that the european union and i hope god uh, prevents the european union from doing it but it could be that they have the uh, approach of the reckless male who conveys or transmits everything that is unpleasant for him to the women. Let's hope that this, uh, this doesn't happen.